today, FDA approvals and liver cancer, renal cell carcinoma, and chronic lymphocytic leukemia, ODAC recommendations in penosynovial giant cell tumor and acute myeloid leukemia, and highlights from a press cast ahead of the 2019 ASCO annual meeting. Welcome to Enclave News Network, I'm Gina Columbus. The FDA has approved single agent ramucirumab for patients with hepatocellular carcinoma who have an alpha fetoprotein of at least 400 ng per milliliter and have been previously treated with serafinib. The approval was based on findings from the International Double Blind Placebo Controlled Multicenter Phase 3 REACH 2 trial in which the median overall survival was 8.5 months with ramucirumab compared with 7.3 months with placebo in patients who experienced progression on or intolerance to frontline serafinib. Results of REACH2 also show that the survival benefit was consistent across all pre-specified subgroups. The 12 and 18 month OS rates both favored ramucirumab at 36.8% versus 30.3% and 24.5% versus 11.3% respectively. And the median progression-free survival was 2.8 months with ramucirumab versus 1.6 months with placebo. In the previously reported REACH trial of patients with advanced HCC, treatment with ramucirumab did not significantly improve OS in the intention to treat population. Yet a pre-specified subgroup analysis showed a significant survival benefit in those with AFP levels of at least 400 ng per milliliter. These data provided a rationale for a follow-up trial to evaluate ramucirumab in patients with elevated AFP. In renal cell carcinoma, the FDA has approved the combination of avelumab and exitinib for the frontline treatment of patients with advanced disease. The approval is based on results from a pivotal phase three Javelin Renal 101 trial, which showed that the combination was associated with a 31% reduction in disease progression or death compared with sunitinib in an intent to treat population of patients with treatment naive advanced RCC, regardless of pdl one expression. Moreover, in the pdl one positive population, the median PFS was 13.8 months with avelumab and exitinib compared with 7.2 months with sunitinib, which led to a 39% reduction in the risk of disease progression or death. The ORR with the combination was 55.2%, which included four complete responses and 51 partial responses compared with a 25.5% ORR with sunitinib. 27 patients in the combination arm had stable disease and 11 had progressive disease. In the overall population, the median PFS with the combination versus sunitinib was 13.8 months and 8.4 months respectively. Overall, the ORR with avelumab plus exitinib was 51.4% and 25.7% with sunitinib. At a follow-up for median OS of 19 months, the OS endpoint remains immature with 27% of deaths in the ITT population. Pfizer, which co-develops avelumab with Merck, stated in a press release that the trial is continuing as planned. The FDA has approved the combination of venetoclax and abinutuzumab for the frontline treatment of patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia or small lymphocytic lymphoma. The approval is based on data from the phase three CLL14 trial, which showed that the venetoclax combination led to a 67% reduction in the risk of disease progression or death versus abinutuzumab plus chlorambucil in patients with treatment naive CLL and coexisting medical conditions. Results also show that the overall response rate was 85% with venetoclax and abinutuzumab versus 71% in the control arm. The complete response or CR with incomplete hematologic recovery rates were 50% versus 23% respectively. The rate of minimal residual disease negativity in the bone marrow was 57% in the venetoclax arm versus 17% in the abinutuzumab and chlorambucil arm. The MRD negativity rates in the peripheral blood were 76% versus 35% respectively. The agency reviewed and approved the application for the venetoclax combination under the Real-Time Oncology Review Pilot Program, which is designed to have a more efficient review process to make therapies more quickly available to patients. Full findings of CLL14 are scheduled to be presented at the 2019 ASCO annual meeting. The FDA's Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee voted 12 to 3 in favor of pexidartinib for an indication as a treatment of adult patients with symptomatic tenosynovial giant cell tumor. The FDA will now make a decision on the pexidartinib indication by August 3, 2019. A priority review designation was initially granted to the application for pexidartinib in February 2019, which was based on results from the International Phase 3 Enliven study, 
results showed a 39.3% overall response rate with pexidartinib versus 0% with placebo following 24 weeks of treatment based on central review of MRI scans. At the ODAC meeting, the committee assessed the clinical benefit of pexidartinib in this patient population as the interpretation of the activity was limited due to a proportion of data missing at 25 weeks for several secondary endpoints, including range of motion, physical function, and worse stiffness. The panel also aimed to characterize the risk of liver injury in patients with TGCT who received therapy with pexidartinib. In the phase three enlivened trial, pexidartinib was associated with increases in alanine aminotransferase, aspartate aminotransferase, and total bilirubin. These adverse events reached at least grade three severity in one third of patients. The FDA briefing document for ODAC also had stated that the long-term safety profile of pexidartinib was unknown. In acute myeloid leukemia, the FDA's Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee voted eight to three against approving a new drug application for quizartinib for adult patients with relapse refractory FLT3 ITD positive disease. The application was filed based on data from the phase three quantum R study in which quizartinib reduced the risk of death by 24% compared to salvage chemotherapy in patients with FLT3 ITD positive relapse refractory AML following frontline treatment with or without hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. At a median follow-up of 23.5 months, the median OS was 6.2 months with quizartinib compared with 4.7 months for chemotherapy. Prior to the ODAC meeting, the FDA had conducted its own efficacy analysis. Here, it was determined that the median OS was 26.9 weeks with quizartinib compared with 20.4 weeks with salvage chemotherapy. Although this analysis confirmed a benefit with quizartinib, the FDA explained in its ODAC briefing document that it found issues in its review raising concerns over the credibility and generalizability of the trial data. These issues included imbalances in the rates of patients who were early censored for OS prior to week eight after randomization and in the number of patients randomized but not treated, inconsistent OS treatment effect by strata based on intensive versus low intensity chemotherapy, confounding of the assessment of OS by the follow-on therapies which patients received after discontinuation from study treatment and lack of treatment effect in additional efficacy endpoints. The agency is now scheduled to make a final decision on the application for the FLT3 inhibitor by August 25th, 2019. In a press cast ahead of 2019 ASCO annual meeting, investigators presented findings across various malignancies. For example, in the phase 1, 1B Star Trek NG trial, Results showed that entrectinib induced objective responses in 100% of pediatric patients with tumors harboring NTRAC1, 2, or 3, ROS1, or ALK gene fusions or mutations. The multikinase inhibitor induced responses in all 11 patients with CNS and solid tumors with these abnormalities, as well as in one patient with ALK mutated neuroblastoma. No responses occurred in patients with tumors lacking these genetic aberrations. Secondly, findings from the National Cancer Institute Children's Oncology Group Pediatric Match Trial Cancer showed that approximately one quarter of pediatric patients with cancer could be screened for targetable alterations in their tumor and directed to a treatment targeting that alteration of pathway in the screening protocol of the study. This rate exceeded the project rate of 10% of patients that would be assigned to a treatment arm. Moreover, data from the GO2 study showed that a lower dose of oxaliplatin and capecitabine had comparable efficacy and minimized adverse events in elderly and frail patients with advanced gastroesophageal cancer. In the study, patients were between the age of 51 and 96 and were randomly assigned to one of three dosage levels, level A, level B, and level C. Progression-free survival was comparable among the groups at 4.9 months, 4.1 months, and 4.3 months for levels A, B, and C, respectively. Overall survival, which was a secondary endpoint, did not vary much between the groups. Patients on level A lived a median of 7.5 months, patients on level B received an average of 6.7 months, and patients on level C lived an average of 7.6 months. Results of the ECOG E3A06 study, which was presented during the press cast, showed that lenalidomide induced a 72% reduction in the risk for progression to symptomatic disease at three years in patients with smoldering multiple myeloma. The time to develop multiple myeloma was also delayed with lenalidomide. Finally, women who eat a balanced, low-fat diet and daily portions of vegetables, fruit, and grains have a 21% lower risk of dying of breast cancer. This was the first large randomized clinical trial to show that diet can reduce the risk of dying from breast cancer.
This week, we sat down with Ricardo Wencioni, MD of the University of Miami Health System, to discuss the future of hepatocellular carcinoma management. Hepatocellular carcinoma, in a way, is a sort of unique cancer. In general, in cancer, either you can offer a curative approach, mostly with surgery, sometimes surgery and radiation, or uh, it's going to be a palliative therapy. HCC is truly different because even those patients who are suitable candidates for radical therapy with resection or ablation are exposed to a very high rate of tumor recurrences. So clearly, outcomes are unsatisfactory in the long term. On the other end, you have a, a large patient population that despite having a large or multifocal disease, still uh, doesn't show any evidence of uh, extrahepatic spread. So there is no nodal involvement and no uh, extrahepatic metastasis. It's a complex scenario where I think um, these um, ongoing studies um, combining uh, the um, best uh, local regional approaches um, with uh, um, ablation or chemoembolization or radioembolization and uh, checkpoint inhibitors will truly try to clarify whether um, there is a synergy uh, between these two uh, therapies uh, so that we can uh, truly offer to more and more patients a chance for cure or at least for a sustained response eventually resulting in uh, longer progression-free survival and overall survival. So I think um, these trials can change the practice um, and probably revolutionize uh, the treatment of HCC over the next few years. That's all for today. Thank you for watching Oncology News Network. I'm Gina Columbus.